think I got everybody. All right. Boy, we'd like to welcome you to the Chatham County Council on Aging. And we'll go right ahead with our virtual health and wellness expo. Great. Good morning, everyone. My name is Julie Wilkerson. I'm the coordinator of the Chatham Health Alliance. And I'm so excited to welcome you to the first presentation of the 2021 Virtual Health and Wellness Expo. The expo is a collaboration between UNC School of Nursing and the Council on Aging. And the first thing I'd like to do is thank the gold sponsors of this year's Health and Wellness Expo, which is um, Alignment Healthcare and CapTel. And I believe that we do have someone on the call from Alignment Healthcare that we would love to give some space to if they'd like to, to say some a few words to everyone. Uh, hello, yes, my name is Dale Neal and I am the community outreach rep with Alignment Healthcare. And uh, we are very honored to be a part of the, the, the expo. And uh, one, of our, uh, one of our mottos is keeping seniors first. And so we are very proud to be a part of this. And um, we are here, we are wanted, to, you know, wanted to get out into the Your community Whitman. and, and Join the meeting. provide any type of service that we can for the community. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dale. And thanks to Alignment Healthcare for your sponsorship this year. Um, so I think without further ado, I would love to introduce our amazing presenters from the UNC School of Nursing. We have Allison Lipscomb, who has a master's of public health and is currently a UNC School of Nursing student, as well as Kelsey Torfey, also a UNC School of Nursing student. And they're here to present to us today their presentation learn about the COVID-19 vaccine. I will turn it over to both of them. Thank you, Julie. And Jackie, can Kelsey share her screen with our slides, please? Jackie, can you hear me? Yep, sorry, I didn't unmute. Yes. Um, yeah, let her go ahead and try to share and see how we do. She can let me know what she's seeing on her end. She says that she's still muted and that she would need to be on. Okay, it. there we go. Thank All you right. guys. All right, welcome everyone. So let me just get our PowerPoint up and going here. For those of you that are just calling in today as well, I believe we had a flyer distributed too. So we'll be sticking to those general points as well. So don't worry if you're just on the phone, we'll definitely work with that as well. All right, so let me get my slideshow going here. All right, so I'll let Allison introduce a little bit further. Yeah, so welcome everybody. We're really excited to meet you all and spend the next 45 minutes talking to you. Um, we are working with, um, we have a public health class this spring and our clinical is working with the Chatham Council on Aging. And okay, join the meeting. And our instructor is Dr. Julie Jacobson Van, who's on the call. Please speak up if you and interrupt me if you need me to slow down or have trouble hearing me. Um, Allison, just so you know, I have muted everybody. Um, oh, so if you okay. could just tr just otherwise, we'll have too much background noise. We will open it up when you're ready for questions. Let me know and I'll unmute everyone. Sounds good. Thank you. Can you hear me okay, Jackie? I can. Yep. Yeah. Let me know if, if you think I'm going too fast or not talking up. Thank you. I'll be happy to do that, thank you. Thanks. So our plan for today is to talk about the COVID-19 vaccine. And even if you've already been vaccinated, and we hope many of you have been, there are still a lot of myths out there about the vaccine and hesitancy to get the vaccine. So even if you've had the shots, you may learn something today to encourage your friends or family members to get vaccinated when it's their turn. 
So um, we're going to talk about some facts and updates about the COVID-19 vaccines. Then we're going to have some time to discuss your experiences and questions around the COVID-19 vaccine. And then we'll have a game at the end to review what we discuss. So play, um, pay attention and we'll have some fun at the end reviewing and, and the winner will be crowned the king or queen of COVID-19 vaccination. And like Kelsey said, if you're joining us by phone, you can follow along with a handout that may have been mailed to you by the council. So I'm gonna hand it off to Kelsey at this point. Great. So I'm just gonna start by going over some of the basic facts um, about the COVID vaccine so far, um, just to recap as well to a general understanding of how these uh, mRNA vaccines work. Cause I know there's a lot of big vocab involved too but I'm hopefully gonna break it down a little bit more and make it easily to understand. So I'm gonna start off with some of the general basics. So as some of you probably know there are currently two vaccines being used right now in North Carolina. So they just issued approval for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine on Saturday which is very exciting but um, I'm not sure the status of that right now, and I suspect it'll probably be a little bit before we actually see those vaccines being distributed in North Carolina. So for now, we're going to focus on the two that we know have been used. Some of you have probably received one or the other of these. Um, there are two different manufacturers that were sort of the first two to come out. One is the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. The other is made by Moderna. So two different manufacturers there. Um, both of which at this point need two doses. So depending on whether you get the Pfizer one or the Moderna one, it'll either be spaced three or four weeks apart. Um, so that's definitely something to keep in mind too. The vaccine is generally effective two to three weeks after your second shot. So that's another big thing to remember is that in between period, it can definitely be tempting after you've had the first one to wanna to see your family and your friends and all these other people that we've unfortunately been so secluded from so far, but it is really, really important to make sure that uh, we're waiting till after that second vaccine and wearing our masks, practicing social distancing. I'll touch on that a little bit later, but so those are kind of the basic overview of what we have right now in North Carolina. Like I said, it's great that that Johnson & Johnson vaccine also has FDA uh, clearance, but we'll uh, start to see that sort of trickling in hopefully within the next couple of weeks, if not sooner. All right, so try not to get, for those of you that are viewing the screen, too overwhelmed with any of the big vocab, but I do wanna just go over very quickly how the vaccines actually work at this point. And I'm gonna do that through a, an analogy because a lot of these terms you would have no knowledge of unless this was something that you were studying specifically. So for just the general population, I think it's been tough to sort of break these things down and make it able to understand, right? So you can kind of think of it in the analogy of a really catchy song. So if you guys would just go through and just take a few minutes, few seconds to think about, everyone's got that one song that the chorus just gets stuck in your head and will not leave, right? Even like little nursery rhymes, like for those of you that have had children, like row, row, row your boat, um, or more recently kids and their baby shark infatuation. So there's, there's that chorus that just gets stuck. And you can kind of think of that as the, what they are calling the spike protein, that identifier on the virus itself. So you can think about, you've got that chorus that gets stuck in your head, and maybe you really want to learn how to play that part of the chorus on the piano. In order to do that, most of us would need some sort of sheet music or some way to write it up so we can see those notes and learn it. And that's kind of what the vaccine helps your body do is learn how to play that chorus, what that chorus sounds like, so that when it hears that chorus, when it encounters the virus itself, it doesn't have to hear the whole song. It doesn't have to know what the whole virus looks like. It just it hears that chorus. It sees that spike protein and it already knows what it's looking at and knows that it's not supposed to be there. And that's how it can sort of launch that attack very, very quickly. And you probably won't even get sick after you've had the vaccine for it because you, your body can recognize that so quickly that it stamps out that infection in a lot of cases before it can even um, take hold and make you feel sick. So that's definitely one of the perks of the vaccine is, and that's what we're trying to accomplish is helping your body join the meeting. That as quick as it possibly can to help keep you and your loved ones from getting sick. 
So I just wanted to give a brief overview on that. And we'll definitely, we can take some questions later too. I know that was kind of a short overview, but just to cover that and to keep in mind as we're talking about the two different vaccines that we've been using so far. So safety and efficacy, those are two big things that weigh on everyone's minds when it comes to the vaccines, right? So both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines, the two that they've been using so far are about 95% effective and that's after two of the doses. So just remember that, that's taking into account both doses. They're looking at how effective either of these are after just one right now, but we don't have great data on that right now. So it's definitely important to keep in mind that that 95% at this point is after both. Um, the 5% that we're missing from that, that 5% didn't experience uh, severe symptoms as well. They had very minor cases. So that's another big thing to keep in mind too, is that you don't have necessarily people getting really, really sick with it um, after getting the vaccines. And that's important, right? Because that's how we know that it's, it's working. It's keeping us safe. So, um, and I wanted to touch a bit on that reaction that has been popping up in the news. I know it's been circulating a lot. There's a lot of concern around it, which is, it's definitely valid. Um, there have been a couple of very rare cases. It's a type of allergic reaction. So they're calling it anaphylaxis. That's the okay. term, but join the meeting, but it's essentially the allergic reaction to some of the uh, vaccines. It is at this point, less than 10 per every million doses. And that's for both types that we have so far. So to put it in perspective, that's a much, much, much lower number than even your chance of having a similar type of reaction from antibiotics or uh, regular medications that we get prescribed all the time too. So I think that's important to keep in mind too with having that comparison because you know you see these cases pop up and it can definitely be, be very concerning to hear the, the occurrence of this, but realizing how frequently this is occurring in relation to how frequent the chances are of that happening with something that we've been prescribed before too. Um, Hopefully that's helpful in giving you guys the information that you need to feel comfortable about it. Um, and when that reaction does happen, it's generally within 15 minutes of getting that shot. So those of you that have already had one, you could definitely speak about it later in the presentation. We'll give you some time to share your experiences. I'm sure your, your colleagues and your peers would love to hear. Um, and that's why they have you wait for that 15, 20, even 30 minute period after you receive the vaccine, because this is when those very rare cases of that reaction have happened. So they wanna make sure that they're watching you, they're right there to treat it if they need to. Um, in most cases, it's treated very similarly as you would another allergic reaction. So they might give you oxygen, they might give um, a drug that's similar to an EpiPen. So it's called epinephrine to help treat that reaction. And in general, they're, they're right there to treat it. Um, so it's been, it's been very safe so far. All right, so what can you expect? Um, I'll let, like I said, some of the people that have already received one a little bit, tell you a little bit later their experience, but in general, the most common side effects um, are similar to those after getting your yearly flu shot. So those of you that have had your flu shots in the past might remember a little bit of soreness or stiffness right in your arm where you received the shot. You might feel a little bit tired, particularly the day after, um, and a slight headache. Those are all more common with this this type of vaccine. Um, I know there's some people that have no reactions whatsoever, no side effects, and there's some people that have soreness and fatigue and headache like some of the ones I've listed. So it's very individual, but generally if you're gonna have any sort of um, side effects from it, it's gonna be one of those three, so. All right, and then most importantly, how can you get one? So at this point, any adult over 65, um, healthcare workers, childcare providers, and teachers, these are all categories that can sign up um, to get the vaccine, to get an appointment right now. They're gonna be starting on other essential workers very soon. I know that's the next category coming up. So if you are interested, you haven't already had your shots, you can call the Chatham County Council on Aging. You can call the Chatham County Health Department. Uh, to get your name on the list and get the information for them to contact you when an appointment becomes available. So for those of you that are seeing the presentation that I have up right now, I've listed the numbers for either Pittsburgh or Siler City. 
There are also in, uh, information on websites. So for the Chatham County Department of Health, they have that listed and the Council on Aging as well too. So I encourage you if you are interested in getting a vaccine to go and check out any one of these resources um, and they can definitely help you get connected, get on the list to be able to get an appointment. All right. Now, like I said, I've talked about how great this vaccine is, how important it is to help us. Um, but like I said, you have to remember after getting the vaccine, it's still very important to remember those three W's that we've been focusing on for the last, gosh, eight or nine months now. I can't believe it's been that long, but wearing that face covering, staying six feet at least apart from other people, particularly in public spaces, washing your hands, preferably, or using hand sanitizer after uh, touching objects and being out and about is always uh, recommended. And we still need to keep doing this after the vaccines because it's important to remember that the vaccines are really great. They're very effective at this point for stopping serious illness in people that receive them. But we still don't have good data on whether you can transmit that infection to somebody else. So they're great at protecting you from getting sick, but there is potentially still the chance for you to pass that to somebody else, which is why we need to continue to practice the wear, wait, and wash those three Ws um, through the vaccination process as well. So at this point, what are any thoughts from people um, maybe who have received one? I think this might be where we need to unmute people. Um, okay, bear with me just a second as I get everybody muted. And hold on a second. All right, so everybody can unmute that wants to unmute. Thanks, Kelsey, for stepping in. I was still muted as well. Yeah. Thank you so much for all that information. So we want to spend a few minutes talking with you all now on your experiences with the vaccine and your thoughts and feelings. Um, we know that there has been a lot of strong feelings about the vaccine and some concerns because it was developed quickly and lots of questions about it. Um, we know this has been a stressful time in general with, the co with COVID in the last year. And so you know, the emotions have run high, but we wanted to provide some space today to have an honest discussion about the vaccine and to hear your feelings, thoughts, and questions. And Jackie, we're gonna ask you to help elicit feedback from the group since you know them so well. Um, so everybody should be okay. unmuted at this point. Thank you. If you can't unmute, if you could please S give me a message in the in the chat feature. I think I've asked everybody to unmute. Um, you're actually uh, on the phone here. and you're muted. You would press star there we go. six. Okay. The, the star and the six. So Kelsey, can you please advance the slide? Of course. Thank you. This this is Joe Johnson, Kelsey. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, like Brout. I, I had Sorry. the pleasure of having both my uh, shots and I suffered very little, if any, effects from it. A little soreness mm -hmm. in the arm and that that was it. Uh, That's great. So I, I strongly recommend, I got the, the Moderna in Siler City and uh, it's it went great. Thank you. Of course, yeah, I'm glad that I you do, I do want to experience. And I just want to ask people, if you identify yourself, please just go by your first name, please, and not your last name. All right. Anyone else want to share? Joe, thank you so much for sharing that. We wanted to hear about, um, we want to start in hearing about the vaccine and what you've heard about it, what some of the rumors that have gone around, um, what facts you know, and then we definitely want to hear about people's experiences getting the vaccine. Um, so the first question we have up here is, what have you heard about the COVID-19 vaccine? And like I said, we could, you could talk about facts. Um, you could talk about what stood, up to, stood out to you from friends or the news or social media. Um, any kind of wild myths out there you've heard. So if you want to share anything related to that, we'll start there. 
This is Kay. I'm, I have a, I have a question, Elizabeth Moffitt. Uh, I didn't mean to say the last night. Okay. Uh, how safe are you after you have taken both of your shots? When I say that, does that mean that uh, we we can still get it? But what us what does it prevent us from? So, and I'll ask Kelsey can jump in too. But sure. So after getting your second shot within two weeks of your second shot, if it's been the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine, which is what is out there right now, you are 95% of people are um, fully protected. 5% of people could still get COVID, but would have a very mild illness and would not have to be hospitalized. Does that help? Oh, yes, yes. Okay. Great. Um, I could maybe just go through some of these questions and then like if people just want to jump in and answer the question that that works for them or sparks their thoughts, that would be fine. So some of the questions we had is what have you heard? Have you gotten the COVID-19 vaccine and how was it? Which is we already heard from Joe. Um, what worries or concerns do you have? Um, have you had any trouble getting the vaccine and what do you want to know about the vaccine? And we go through each one of those, but I also know that we might just want to have an open conversation about it. So um, other experiences? Hi, this, yeah. this is Kay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I had my second vaccination yesterday and I had heard so much about the second shot being a lot stronger and, and that you got fever and chills and everything and I'm fine. Join the meeting. Uh, Hello? Can, can you hear me? I'm Mary Lou. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Allison, can you hear Mary Lou? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I have, okay. I've encountered five individuals who, after the first uh, vaccine, developed swelling of the glands under the arm or in the groin area. I wanted to know if you have any comments on that. I know the doctor told me not to have a mammogram for at least four weeks after the second dose, that uh, they are noting that on the mammograms, swelling is in the uh, armpit, the lymph nodes. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I had not heard that, but it, to me it makes sense because um, that's where you're getting that strong immune reaction from your lymph nodes. And um, I would also welcome Kelsey or other nurses to address that. But um, that's interesting about the mammogram, but it makes sense. Yeah, that's a that's actually a great observation, and it's um, that's your immune system really kicking in and recognizing that. So that's it's almost it's the response that we like to see. We like to see your body recognizing that that's being introduced and sort of making those antibodies, so that if you were exposed to COVID the next time, it says very very quickly is able to launch that response and stop the illness before you start to feel anything. So I know it can happen sometimes with other vaccines too, and it can be kind of uncomfortable, especially if it's swelling in the neck too. So it's definitely one of those side effects that's a bit less common, but can still happen. And um, I know some people will get swollen lymph nodes when they encounter colds and things like that as well too. And Again, that's your, your body launching that immune reaction. So hopefully that's a good thing. It should be able to recognize Brooke. very Join quickly the meeting. and stop an infection. This is uh, Neria Boone. And I just um, want to express that I've heard skepticism from some African-Americans uh, mm -hmm. because of uh, this, the Tuskegee uh, ex experiment years ago. Uh, and some other things that have happened with African Americans, and what I what I'm doing is encouraging people to take the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very important. Um, and you know, we definitely we know that African Americans have been affected um, disproportion or disproportionately by COVID, um, have gotten it more, and also have had worse cases of it. So. And we understand some of those hesitations, but I think word of mouth, like you're talking about and encouraging other people in your network That's your is car. gonna help a lot. So thank Join you. Join the meeting. I don't hear anything. I apologize about the, the disruption as people enter, but we can't, we can't block them out. So I apologize that there's the little um, 
extra noise you're hearing is people are still joining us. <clears throat> so, um, and I'll just add that um, someone has added into the into the comments um, about rumors, and she said that one person has sent messages to her repeatedly asking about the number of people that have died from the vaccine, and his his colleagues have been spreading rumors about this. Do you have any comment about that? I would, you know, one thing I would I would think about in responding to that is the number of people who have died from COVID, looking at the, what's it, 500,000 people now in the United States. And, um, and I'm not sure, Julie, I'm not sure if you know the statistics on how many people have died from the vaccine, but looking back at what um, Kelsey shared earlier about the chances of a serious allergic reaction is about one in 10 million. I think it must be a very low number. Well, and that's exactly, this is actually somebody I grew up with in Northern Wisconsin, um, mm -hmm. who has even texted me at seven this morning, asking about the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. And he asked me about deaths from the vaccine. And I responded to him with, it was something like one or two people out of, and it might've been 15 million. I may have looked at some data that were a little different than what you guys mm -hmm. said, but similarly, that there have been X number of um, anaphylactic reactions, the number is really small, and that I was not, had not even heard of any deaths at all. So I just wanted to point that out, that there are a lot of people that are sort of spreading these rumors. Yeah, and it was confusing. Sorry yeah. to, to jump well, in here too. I was going to say, Kelsey, if you could share what you had learned about people who've died from, um, I think it was penicillin or antibiotics compared to the yes. vaccine. Yes. So I, let me see here. I can pull up the numbers even uh, later on as well too. And to touch on the COVID vaccine deaths too, it can be misleading sometimes the information that's presented versus when you sort of trace it all the way back to the source too. There have been a couple of deaths that have occurred because of COVID after just the first vaccine of the two in the series. So that's where it's really, really important to make sure that you're still keeping yourself from being exposed in between the two because the um, efficacy of the vaccines at this point, they believe is lower in between the two. And that's where you have a very, very few uh, number of cases that passed away after receiving the first vaccine, but not necessarily because of the vaccine itself, but because of the fact that they were exposed in between the two doses before getting their second dose. So I've definitely seen that one is another one that sometimes depending on where you're reading to, they'll pick up on, you know, this person passed away after receiving the first of the two vaccines. And when you dig a little bit deeper, you realize in some of the cases, at least the ones that I've seen has been a result of actually COVID being exposed to COVID in between the two. So. I think mean, that's another, as everyone's getting vaccinated, definitely another point to, to keep in mind because we still have to be safe in that interim period. This is Juliana. Um, and I would like, Juliana, can you wait just a second? Um, so um, we did have, um, Zach Corner has commented, had put in the comment that according to the CDC quote to date, the VAERS has not detected patterns in cause of death that would indicate a safety problem with COVID-19 vaccinations. Um, so just wanna add that in. Go ahead, Juliana. Just inquiring the MRS, whatever was up on the screen. Yes, the does, MRA. Does, yeah, what does it stand for? What is the relationship between whatever that stands for and COVID? So that's a, it's a great question. And I'm going to try not to go down a rabbit hole because the thing with the vaccines is they're incredible and incredibly complex too. So the mRNA stands for messenger RNA. And that's basically, you can think of it as, um, it's not that it sounds like DNA, but it's a little bit different from that. So as opposed to DNA, which is a part of your cells and stays around for a long time and tells them exactly how they're supposed to live and function. The mRNA is like, um, you could think of it as like a disappearing ink message. So it's a message that gets passed into your cells to tell them how to make something specific. In this case, they're using that to tell them how to make that uh, protein that's on COVID 
not the whole COVID itself, right? So not the whole virus, but this tiny little marker on the outside, it's telling it to how to make it. And then it sort of disappears, disintegrates very, very quickly. So that's kind of, if we're going to go back to the music analogy, it's almost like if somebody handed you the sheet music to tell you how to play a song, but it's written in disappearing ink and then all of a sudden disappears. So you learn how to, to play the song, but you don't necessarily have that the instructions right there with you to help reminding you. So it that's how the vaccine works is it that's what's providing sort of the written instructions for how to recognize COVID without actually using any of the virus itself, if that makes any sense. And please let me know if there's anything you need to clarify with that too, because it's well, not, just, not easy to understand. I'll just quickly do this, um, just quickly for that. Um, yeah. So are vaccines, whether Pfizer or Moderna or now Johnson & Johnson, are they not saying that they're using different messengers? Yeah, so the, both the Moderna and the Pfizer both use mRNA. The Johnson & Johnson one is a little bit different. Um, it uses something called an adenovirus vector, which again, sounds like, cra like why, crazy, right? Like why would, we use, why would we use a virus to protect ourselves from a virus? But what they're able to do in the labs is um, adenovirus itself is generally in the worst form, very, very, very mild. So it can cause um, mild cold symptoms. They think it might contribute to pink eye um, before it's changed. So they change that in the labs. They make it so that it can't inf actually infect humans and cause illness. And what they do is they include the instructions, those mRNA instructions in that, basically the outside of the adenovirus capsule. And then they use that to help get into the cells and to give it that mRNA message. So it, that again, that small little bit of instructions that then disappears, um, but isn't a uh, virus that is able to infect you. It used, it's, um, and the best analogy that I could find for that is basically like a shuttle, like an empty shuttle that just kind of goes back and forth. And that's the part that that plays. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that. of course. I hope it was helpful. What other questions, thoughts, experiences do you all want to share? Yes, Daryl. I was I was thinking that uh, when you get COVID, um, you know, you have an immune system, and your immune system would be alerted, and your immune system would go and fight on the back, but fight on the virus. I had a hard time understanding you at the end. Is it? Do you have a question? Could you repeat that, Daryl? Yeah, could you repeat it? I says when you first get COVID. I was thinking that your immune system would be alerted to the COVID presence and it would go and fight off the, um, the virus. It, it, it does. So the way that um, your immune system would work is you have a general immune response when you're first exposed to the virus. And I think that's something that's partly what's making COVID so dangerous for some people is that their immune response is almost too strong and they're getting a lot of inflammation, but you don't have a specific immune response the first time you're exposed to the virus. So you don't develop that until after you've already had the virus and recovered from it. So the next time you encounter it, then you have that stronger immune response. And that's what a vaccine is doing is to trigger your body to have that strong, stronger immune response without actually having had the virus. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay, that's a great question. Any other questions or comments about the COVID vaccine or anything else you want to know about it? This is really this good is feedback. Bill and I... Hello, this is Bill. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, Bill. Go ahead. I got my first shot yesterday at the Ag Center. And I was so... Ex and I tell you, I have never been so excited 
about getting a shot b before her. <laughs> because it took me a long time to arrange it. Oh, I'm so happy. And I know there was just so much relief, right? Yeah. Well, I figure the sooner I get vaccinated, the better my chances are of surviving. <laughs> and I am yes. determined to survive the pandemic. Yes. Yes. And, and hope all my friends do, too. That's great. So you're spreading the and, word. And I think, I think that's a good, a good comment, Bill. Um, and Allison, um, you guys may want to comment on this. The one thing that we get with the, with the vaccination is we something now within our control. And for so much of this COVID experience, it has not been within our control. And now we have some control that if we choose to get the vaccination, we are taking positive steps forward. Do you want to make any comments about that? A positive step forward. Yes, I like that. That's something to remember. I like that too, Jackie. Because so much of the time, our stress levels raise when we don't have any control and we are yes. suddenly getting control. And so this will allow, and that's good for our immune system as well, is to we're suddenly feel charge. like, okay. We're taking, yes, charge we're taking charge of it instead of complaining about it. <laughs> right. And we're able and to move about forward. It. Yeah. Right. yeah. I would like to make a comment. And that's a good feeling. And, okay. I'm, uh, and that's a feeling I'm enjoying right now. Okay. And who was that that said Mary wanted to make Lou. a comment? Mary Lou. I just want Mary to. Lou? I would just want to compliment the health department on the excellent organization that they did for the vaccine uh, administration. It was so smooth and so well organized, and I was very impressed with it. And I'm not the only one. I've had a lot of people give the same feedback. So thank you very much for the job that you have done with the health department. Thank you. I'd like to comment on that. That um, I too was very impressed with how well organized and coordinated that operation was. There was so many cars going through that parking lot at the ag center, mm -hmm. you know. But it, but it, but it went so smoothly and efficiently. And, and I was very impressed. I'm sure that took a lot of planning. Mm -hmm. So we have Zach Horner on the call right now, I believe, and he's with the health department. He does their communications. And I don't know if he wants to talk about some of those efforts. And maybe, too, if, if anybody has anything they'd want to share back to the health department on any sort of barriers um, that they had, perhaps this is now a good time to do that. Definitely. Thanks, Allison. Hello, everybody. My name is Zach Horner. I'm the communications specialist for the Chatham County Public Health Department. Um, I've actually been working with Allison and Kelsey on some communications things the last few weeks. I um, really, was really excited to hear their presentation. Um, thank you guys so much for your feedback on the events that we've been doing. It's so uh, encouraging and, and helpful to hear from you guys about uh, how those events have gone and, and what that experience has been like for you. We've uh, been working really hard to, to try to make those as smooth and efficient as possible. We've seen other counties where lines have been hours and hours long and um, really did not want that to happen. So we're so grateful that um, things turned out as well as they did. So um, if you have any, like Allison said, if you guys have any feedback or anything else you want to share, um, feel free to feel free to let me know. Are you the same Zach Horner that was in the park early on and came upon the masked marvels i sure did that was me <laughs> <laughs> and that I was one of the that. masked marvels speaking <laughs> that's right i remember that's, that that's right. Right. We, have, we have another one on uh, esther cars online she's one of the masked marvels also Very yes cool. <laughs> we're still going strong we we had a little downtime because of the weather we're going to meet again this week but we're still going strong very cool yes ma'am i remember that that was really cool to see mm -hmm. Jackie, should we move on to the final part of the review or do we have time for some more questions? Um, that's entirely up to you. I'll let you make that call. Okay. Well, maybe we'll see if there's one or two more questions or comments and then we'll move on to the review part. Okay. Any more questions or comments, anybody? 
I have a quick question. Okay. This is Kay. Um, boosters, I heard there may be boosters after these first two shots. Do you have any information on this type of thing? I have heard that too, and I don't know the answer to that um, in terms of more information. Kelsey or Julie, do you know anything else about boosters or Zach? I know Moderna is currently working on potentially getting some out. I have not heard anything specifically about the Pfizer version. I, I believe I've heard some about Johnson & Johnson as well too, potentially, but I think that it's something we might have to wait and see about. Um, I, must, I would assume that if Moderna is working on them, then Pfizer and the other companies are probably looking at that as well. But I think they're kind of waiting to see how effective these are going to be against the variants. Um, and because of the fact that it's targeting that part of the, it's making your body recognize that part of COVID that all of, if not most of these variants share mostly in common, they're thinking that they're gonna be fairly effective still, but there's just a lot, unfortunately, about these new emerging types that we don't know everything about yet. So I think, I guess my recommendation would be to keep keep an eye out. Um, there's definitely like the Chatham County Department of Health, I know, the Council on Aging is tries really hard to be proactive about getting the newest up-to-date information out there too. So I'm sure they'll be in touch uh, when we have more information on that. But it's definitely, it's a tough situation. It's constantly constantly evolving and changing. So I don't know if Julie or anyone else has more up-to-date info on that, but well, that's C about all I know. And the CDC basically right now says that they don't know how long protection lasts. And I did hear on the news just a couple of days ago, they were talking about how it's likely that we may need, you know, similar to flu vaccine, um, a booster every year or two, but they really don't know at this point. Okay. I have a, okay. I, this is Val. I have a comment I'd like to make and a question. Okay. The comment is that I got sick from both, both shots. Mm -hmm. um, my second shot, I got very sick um, for three days. Chills, headache, fever, pain, you name it. But I, I know that's better than getting COVID-19 a bad read getting a severe case of COVID-19. But my question deals with um, advice to people who anticipate a strong immune response and their tendency to perhaps take a prophylactic ahead of time. Mm -hmm. I took Tylenol. Mm -hmm. um, my, re my response started eight hours after I got the shot and lasted for 70 hours. Mm -hmm. But um, I started taking Tylenol about 12 hours after I first developed a headache and my fever started to go up. But I have heard that some people are, have been advised or have chosen to take Tylenol or ibuprofen or something like that in advance. And yeah. could you talk about the potential sort of yeah. negative impact on the effectiveness of the vaccine if you take Tylenol ahead of time. So Val, I'm sorry that you got so sick after the vaccine. I know some people did not have a fun experience and I'm sorry that you were one of those. Um, I, I would think I had not heard about taking Tylenol or ibuprofen before getting the vaccine, but it makes a lot of sense to me because I know when I've gotten other um, procedures done, like dental procedures, for instance, sometimes you're told to take it prophylactically just to avoid some of that pain. Or Join the meeting. Um, I don't think that there would be any, I don't, I, I can't see any reason why it would affect the I, um, effectiveness of the, the vaccines. Side. Yeah, well, yeah, go ahead. Okay, this, is, this one I know about. Um, and actually the American Academy of Pediatrics is now coming out recommending against prophylactic oh. um, analgesics or anti-inflammatories <clears throat> before vaccines. And um, sorry, taking a drink of water. Um, and that's partly, and there are several reasons, and I, being a former public health nurse and giving many vaccinations over the decades, never recommend them. And it's, it's one of those controversial things. Some studies are starting to show now 
that people that take, and it's primarily children, but we don't know about adults that take prophylactic um, things like Tylenol before vaccines, that they're finding that they may be less effective. So that's one thing to consider. And then one other thing to consider is- uh, Julie, Julie, let me just clarify. So you're saying that the effect of the immunization is less effective. Their immune system does not respond as well. Exactly. And it's not okay. a big difference, but that's one thing that they're starting to consider so that pe pediatricians are stopping recommending giving something like Tylenol before a vaccine. And then um, one of the other things that, that I think about often when it comes to giving something like Tylenol before a vaccine is that if you're not sure how you're going to react, to me, if you're going to take something like Tylenol beforehand, you might be kind of weakening the reaction if you're going to have a reaction. So for instance, let's say you get take that Tylenol before your first one, and maybe you've got a mild reaction, but maybe if you wouldn't have taken that Tylenol, it would have been a little more severe. So then when you go for the second one and they ask you, well, how did you do with the first? You can more accurately describe how you reacted, or if you took Tylenol, it might have been kind of masked. And if you mask those symptoms, you can't really tell somebody what your real reaction would be. And then maybe they don't know to have you like wait 30 minutes after your vaccine. So um, again, you're gonna find a lot of people having different opinions of this, but lately the research is kind of showing and discouraging use of something like Tylenol before the vaccine. Elizabeth Moffitt. Julie, Elizabeth, do you have a question? Okay, sorry. Julie, can they take, that's really interesting. Um, did you see in the literature if it's okay to take Tylenol ibuprofen right after the vaccine? Or is it, do you know what the recommendations are? What I've read was right before, but yet if the vaccine is trying to, I mean, logically, if the vaccine takes a while to work, um, logically it would seem that taking it right after is going to have a similar diminished effect. Number one, you're not going to be able to see what your true response is. And two, if there is some slight lessening of the, fact, the effectiveness, it's likely to occur then afterwards. So um, personally, I would never recommend it to anybody. And when I've given vaccines, I've never recommended it. And I've certainly never let my child have it. Um, oh, I would like to say at this point, um, I think, do we have any other major comments or questions? Um, we can attempt to do some breakout rooms. And um, so what we could do is we could put um, Dale from Alignment Healthcare into one of the breakout rooms and Allison into another one for um, any more questions. Does that sound like a good thing to do at this point, Allison? Jackie, do we have time to do the last activity together? That's just a brief review and game. Before we oh, definitely. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, thank you. So, um, Kelsey, could you? All right. Okay. So, we're going to play a quick game. Um, so, the rules are to keep track of your points, and we'll use the honor system. And um, the award you get at the end is applause and recognition from those of us on the call today, and you'll be deemed the vaccine king or queen. So the first question is, and you can just chime in with the answer. It's safer to get vac to get COVID than to get the vaccine. True or false? False. false. All right. False. Yes, we know that COVID causes serious respiratory illness and that many have died, especially over the age of 65. Kelsey, we can go ahead and advance it. And chronic health, and also COVID can cause chronic health effects. And you may know people who have been affected this way whereas the vaccine has mild and short-term side effects on the whole. Um, and then to the, the next question. My chance of having a serious reaction to the vaccine is around 10 in 1 million. True. 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 Uh, so the chance of serious side effects is very low. It's mostly like getting your annual flu shot with mild side effects for most with arm pain, feeling under the weather for a day sort of symptoms. All right, next question. If I've already had COVID, I don't need the vaccine. 
False. 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 That is false. We don't know how, we don't know if or how long you're immune after having COVID-19. Um, the safest way to re avoid reinfection is to get the vaccine series. And I know they are exploring the possibility that some people who've had COVID would just need to get one shot, but they're not, um, the research is not conclusive on that yet. Let's move forward. So only one of the vaccine types, for example, Pfizer or Moderna is safe and effective. Therefore, I should wait for that vaccine type. False. 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 Yes, that is false. Both Pfizer and Moderna are around 95% effective and the other 5% mostly got mild illness as Kelsey talked about. So at this point, it's best to accept the first vaccine you have access to. All right, next question. I am currently eligible to get the COVID-19 vaccine. True or false? True. true. That's true. So if you are 65 years and older, if you're a healthcare worker, a teacher, um, you are now eligible for the vaccine in North Carolina. And then coming up soon are other frontline essential workers. All right, next question. To register for the vaccine, I should call the senior centers of the Chatham Council on Aging. And I can add here as well, or the health department. True. 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 That is true. true. We've got some enthusiastic responders. I love it. <laughs> um, and so even though you're eligible, there is a limited supply at this time. So you need to go ahead and get your name on the list and you'll be called when a vaccine is available. Mm. All right. So this is our last question. Once I have received my second vaccine, I can go ahead and visit my church or family and not wear a mask anymore. False. 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 That is false. Yep, y'all are good. Um, your immunity should be complete two weeks after your second vaccine. However, to be safest, it is best to still wear a mask, wash your hands, and keep six feet apart until more people have been vaccinated. We are also not certain that the vaccine prevents you from contracting the disease and passing the illness on to others, even if you are not sick. So um, go ahead and advance, Kelsey. Good job. I'm going to say that all of you are kings and queens of the COVID-19 vaccine. We had everybody with 100% on all these questions, and we had a lot of good responses. Um, so just in conclusion, we encourage you to get your vaccine if you haven't, and encourage your friends and families to do so once they are eligible. And we appreciate you. Um, our time mm -hmm. with you today. So thank you. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, Allison. Allison. Thank, thank you, Kelsey. Thank you. Kelsey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Reminders. The first one <clears throat> is that there is an Expo website going along with these presentations. It's being hosted on the Chatham Health Alliance website. I believe there is a link on the flyers that the Council on Aging has been sending out. But if you go just to the Chatham Health Alliance website, there'll be a pop-up right when you get there that you can just click on to be taken to the Expo website. There's tons of great information on there. There are pages for each of the focus areas, including the vaccine focus areas. So if you want to learn even more than you learned today, I encourage you to go check out <clears throat> that website, the website. So again, that's chathamhealthalliancenc.org. Yep, that is it. All right, and then the very last thing is just to let you know that there will be a presentation on the focus areas every Tuesday in March at 11.15. Those presentations, I'm just gonna list them out for you really quickly. The next one is on March 9th and that is Health is Wealth, Being Active. And that's focusing on the focus area of being active. On March 16th will be Home Safety Tips and Falls Prevention. On March 23rd, eating good and feeling better. Those are all of my reminders. And I really appreciate all of your time and the presentation today. And I hope you all have a good rest of your day.